So welcome everyone. Uh, today's topic is informal settlements, uh, which is a controversial title, right, to begin with. We'll get into that. Um, before we get into the lecture, I want to remind you all that um, every Friday, we expect you to arrive in class having read the reading. Uh, this week's reading was uh, a bit longer than usual, but quite accessibly written, but beautifully brings together the actual lived experience on the ground, like the analysis exercise, with uh, big issues, big questions, philosophical questions. And this author does a brilliant job, I think, of connecting the philosophical uh, thoughts of Aristotle and everybody since Aristotle, uh, touching on this issue of property uh, ownership in its relationship to human rights. Really well done. Uh, one of the best readings of the semester. If you just skimmed it, um, I strongly recommend uh, digging more deeply uh, in, at your leisure, maybe on the weekend, maybe over the summer when you have less to do, I hope. Um, because this reading and the entire book is a very uh, interesting point of entry into the topic. Um, the expectation is not only that you do the reading before class on Friday, but that you uh, make three contributions to the chat before, at the beginning, and during the lecture. So what we want, uh, the three, uh, just to remind you, the three contributions we're looking for. Number one, what is this, in a single sentence, what is the most important takeaway from the reading? I'm saying takeaway. I'm not saying summary. I'm not saying uh, description of you know, something like one common mistake is to describe uh, New Earth writes about informal settlements uh, around the world. That's not a takeaway. The takeaway is something that 30 years from now, when your team is dealing with the issues of informality, they, they, they're facing a question, and out of the blue, Jonah says, uh, well, we should all know that uh, this really boils down to, and then she gives the one sentence takeaway from New Earth. Her teammates are blown away. She gets promoted. The United Nations uh, calls her up and asks her to lead the, the project to solve the problem of informality that has swept across North America. Okay. So uh, also the expectation, so that's the takeaway. The second contribution to the chat is a burning question. Uh, and here we want you to get in touch with your own sense of agitation. I sometimes say, uh, we want you to be a little pissed off. As, and if you're not pissed off, you're not paying attention. We want you to wake up, pay attention, look at the world around you, look at the problems you are facing in your careers. And if you're not a little pissed off, you're not paying attention or you don't care enough. So from that uh, position of being appropriately stimulated, appropriately agitated, you should have a strong, maybe even fierce sense of injustice in the world, and you should say, hey, Wentworth, I'm paying all, someone's paying all this money, I'm giving you the best years of my life. In this lecture, right now, I need the answer to this question. This is an urgent question that me and my generation and this discipline are facing. Given where we parked the Wednesday Forum, the things that were unresolved in the Wednesday Forum just two days ago, given the questions that are emerging out of the reading, we most urgently need this question answered in this lecture right now. Give us the answer. God damn it. It's the appropriate engagement. Um, and then the third, the third question, the third contribution to the chat, 
during this lecture, I'm going to be presenting things that um, we are going to be presenting things that uh, bring up a new sense of urgency. Maybe we answered the question that you put in the chat already, but uh, in the answering of that question, something else comes up that you feel a sense of urgency about. And it's not just a, pro provoc a provoking question for us, the lecturers, it's also a provoking question to you, yourself, and your classmates, because just as we are turning the car keys of the world over to you uh, in the process of your education, let's not wait till you graduate. Let's turn the car keys over to you and the responsibility for the world over to you during this lecture and so that you and your colleagues can pick up the ball. I'm switching analogies here from the car to the football game. Um, you, we're dropping the ball on the field. We are fumbling the ball on the field to be more precise. And you can either let it sit there and watch the world go to hell, or you can jump on that ball, pick it up and run for the end line as best you can. This is the purpose of the third contribution of the chapter. Um, and so those three things, any, any questions about that? And you can put that in the Zoom chat, you can put it in, I'm watching the Brightspace chat, if you have a question about the assignment. Um, and now at this point, we should be seeing, we have, we should be, we should have 45 students in the Zoom call and 45 faces looking at us uh, with your cameras on. If there's less than 45 cameras on, uh, there should be the number of cameras off should be matched by private messages in the Zoom uh, telling us what you are doing to or what your dad is doing in some cases or what DTS is doing to address the uh, problem of the camera not being on. I'm not seeing any question about the chat. Um, I'm not seeing any private chat about um, your camera. Okay. Thank you. And we we have a history of being quite understanding. Uh, if you, but we do need you to say something. We do need you to declare the reason. Uh, why uh, your camera is not on. Uh, you can't not have your camera on and not say anything. Okay. With that, um, what was the third thing? Thank you, Shay. What was that third thing? The third thing was a question that emerges in the, in the course of the lecture. One of us will say something, will show something, and uh, you, need, you need to comment on it. Something that emerges out of your active engagement with the lecture. Okay. Thank you, Shay. You can always count on Shay. Okay. So if there's no other questions about what we're doing today, um, we have so much to cover. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Manuel. Okay, thank you. I, I First, I wanna excuse me for not being in the class the last uh, uh, Monday, Wednesday. I, I was, and, and this morning I am feeling really uh, bad but i wanted to be here because i think this is the place where you have to be this is the right place to be at this moment i think it's things are happening in this room that i don't want to miss and i and i want to transmit that to you i'm just uh, well what happened was that i was 
finally, I was taking the vaccine for the COVID-19. That was two days ago, and today I feel terrible. But but I feel happy because I could sleep well. I was very wor worried about the not having that vaccine or being exposed all the way. So it's a it's a good feeling. And please try to convince your parents and and even grandparents to to get the vaccine. This is a thing to do. No, you don't need them too much, but the, your parents do. You may need them some, but your parents really do. I just wanted to do this introduction because I actually rather uh, would like to stay all the time, all the lecture trying to, if I feel better, um, listening and looking at the presentation and the discussion, which is going to be very interesting. But I wanted just, I, I just as an introduction, I wanted to tell you how I, how I uh, get engaged with Robert in this adventure about about design that comes from the living part of design, the design in, as a living as a living being. And I want to tell you uh, just a short story about how can we engage both of this in this thing. Robert came with the initiative to uh, 2007 studio in Caracas and focusing he was already looking at the informal sector from far away for me Caracas is my town so I offered myself to be his guide and when we sp when we, we we were looking for a site because because we had seven or eight sections with the, in the in the sophomore studio that needed the, the site to the start developing. They couldn't, unfortunately, they couldn't come, the other students and, and faculty. So we were transmitting all the information to them. And it's funny because we went, we went to Caracas. We, there were so many things to do and to see that we, at the fourth, five day, fifth day, Robert asked me, when are we gonna visit the site? And I realized that that was in the backyard of my house, my city, has like a backyard, which is the barrios. And I want to talk about the name as well. The thing is that I, I have forgotten, I gave like a grant for granted that Robert knew the barrios. And I thought that, and we went to the barrio and we, I had a different, a different, totally different view of the barrio looking at, at the place with him. Because the the way the, the, the barrio moves, the way the, the people live is, is completely different. It's, it's something that, and he is going to explore that in the lecture, and I think it's, this is very important. Some aspects about the barrio that I wanted to, to tell you is that it's, it's the, the barrio express the place where people that is moving from one place to another finally finds a settlement, a place to stay, or, or a place to live. And this phenomenon of the of the barrio, of the of the settlement, looking for a settlement as a refugee is something that I have lived as well. So I had, when I came to Boston, came for, for two years to do a master in, in MIT and ended being here for more than 20. And uh, when I was in the seventh year approximately, I, I think I, at that moment I said, well, I think this is gonna be my city. I, I cannot come back. And that sensation that travel, uh, that seven or seven million people out of 30 million people of the country, the, the country has 30 pe million people. And you know that seven million has left Venezuela as refugees in, and they are in other parts of the world. Many of them left Venezuela walking like, and it was the second country in number of refugees in the last, in the last decade. So the situation is that people leave their homes and people establish in another place. That's in that situation that makes defines the, the, the force of the of the settlement, the force of the refugees, and what we need to look at to try to understand. I think I, I have the experience that every refugee that moves carries their house on top of of of, of themselves. The house is with you all the time. The house where I live is my house. I, it's the only one I have. And it was before in Venezuela, and then I moved it with me here. So the object, the thing, the, 
the photographs, the, all the, they are all the same. So that is the sensation. So those for informality, that informality is is not in the terms of the shape of the buildings. It's about the informality comes from the forces that move and define the space. This is this is what I wanted to point out. The difference between formal and informal. And in Venezuela, we solved the problem of the name, calling them barrios. Barrios means uh, means uh, neighborhoods. So it the, the, the name was too long at the beginning. It was barrios for for uh, informal settlement, or, and we ended calling them barrios, which is the plain name of of a neighborhood. So barrios took the name of the neighborhood, and the, the neighborhoods called differently now. They call urbanization. They call themselves. Because the barrio is the barrio is the name of the settlement that is not yet defined, that is in the process of adaptation, and the people who live there makes it their own. This is this is the important thing of the per personal experience of the barrio. So informality is a force that brings life to a place, and that place is full of life because the life of the people that brings from many other countries and many other, many other places what is uh, the knowledge of the city what and that is in everybody's backyard we have that barrio that we have not yet accepted and that is our our other face the, the backyard face so I, I just wanted to make this introduction and unfortunately i i, I will i will be as much as possible in the lecture if I feel good, but uh, I, I appreciate the. Really, I want to thank Robert for engaging me again in what is mine, what is my back, by backyard, and really that has been a very good experience. He has talked about the the progress of that experience in the experience of designing for life, many times. So, I'm not repeating that, but the, it was very interesting. That I appreciate it very much from Robert, and thank you. So uh, Robert will be, will be next with the lecture. Thank you, Manuel, and and I uh, hope you feel better quickly. Um, we all Thank hope you feel better quickly. So I'm going to share my screen. And I'm looking for confirmation that you all are seeing that. You see my screen? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. That's so wonderful. Um, so informal settlements. Um, is the topic we're going to move very quickly through seven distinct parts of this question, this issue, this world. And uh, this lecture is designed to prepare you as everything in the course and uh, ideally everything in your professional training, your professional preparation, your professional education. Ideally everything is very clearly designed to help you be effective and have an impact and uh, be skilled at identifying where architecture can have the greatest impact with the least investment. And uh, we prioritize the most serious threats uh, facing your generation in the coming century. I sound like a broken record, but it can't be emphasized enough. Um, so this lecture is very much designed to prepare you to emerge through your professional engagements as leaders uh, capable of having uh, impact. And so with that in mind, how crazy would it be if 30 years from now you're sitting there in the room where the problems are being grappled with. And uh, your team says, wait a minute, what are the five 
What are the five conditions for informality? How is it defined by UN Habitat? What is it? And you know that you had that in the lecture way back in 2021. Oh, oh, I know this. I had this. Uh, uh, but I didn't write it down. I don't remember, and there's nothing I can do about it. I can't look it up. Oh my God, what a horrible feeling. So I want to encourage you to not have that feeling 30 years from now, when the thing that we are laying out with absolute clarity in this lecture, we're working really hard here. Come on, people, meet us halfway. Write this stuff down. Do not shame us when you get into the room 5, 10, 20, 30 years from now. Please have the answers at your fingertips because no one else is going to. Do you think your colleagues uh, in the profession who graduated from Northeastern, do you think they studied this? I'm not sure, maybe they do, but not as deeply and not with such authority as uh, we bring to it, Manuel and I bring to this, and Ignacio. Um, so please, uh, friends don't let friends leave the money on the table. The money is right here. Grab this and put it in your pocket and invest it wisely as you move into the profession. Please take notes. Planetary urbanization. This is the new term that we keep talking about uh, in uh, architecture, planning, and urban design, which is the we are bringing together those three separate fields into a single field. That is what we are doing in the 21st century. Architects can no longer afford to continuously reinforce the barricade between architecture and the rest of the world. Those barricades have been torn down and architects, instead of defending and rebuilding those barricades, we are now stepping over those barricades, stepping out into the world, bringing the amazing power of architectural tools to bear on the problems of the rest of the world, all the time tethered back to architecture. So because we are tethered back to architecture, we can courageously step over the ruins of the barricades into the world, deal with those problems, all the while bringing the power and benefit of architecture to bear on these problems. That is what we are doing. And by we, I mean you. Now we used to, when I first taught this topic, when I started teaching this topic uh, in 2003, um, I, I made, I found this data. I was the first one I've ever known who made this chart of human history population. Now it's a pretty common thing. Um, I'm the one who started using the term peak human. I've yet to hear anyone else use it, but peak human is all we care about. When you open up a reading and the first paragraph, and I, this happens to me at least on a weekly basis, I read something where um, an otherwise very highly respected architect or urbanist is writing something. And the first paragraph is, uh, in the next 30 years, human population is expected to rise to 8 billion people. Boring. We don't care. By saying it that way, you are ignoring the fact that the human population is going to hit 8 billion and not pause for a moment. It's going to, it's not rising to 8 billion. It is shooting right past 8 billion. We don't care about 8 billion. We used to care about 9 billion, which was the expected peak human population in 2060. Oops, we dropped the ball. And we shot, we now know that human population is shooting right past 9 billion. It's shooting right past 10 billion. Now we're targeting 11 billion for peak human in around 2100. What makes a difference? Is any government anywhere doing anything? Well, the Chinese government for a while tried, the Indonesian government tried, 
Um, and the Chinese government was actually extremely impactful with their one child policy. But oh my God, what a hardship and what a horrible thing to impose on the Chinese population. Um, so we have since learned, we've learned a couple of things. Number one, no government, no uh, organization, uh, nobody is going to do anything about human population growth. There is nothing. There is no lever, there's no wheel, there's no button. There's nothing anyone can do to have any impact at all on human population, except to increase it. Uh, Mormons, um, Orthodox Jews, other religious sects, they have taken it upon themselves to procreate uh, to the maximum possible biological uh, limits. Um, but it's not having much of an impact. Is the pandemic reducing the human population? No. Did the Black Death have an impact on the human population? Uh, there's a slight slowdown, but there's never a dip. So the number one rule, there is nothing that any of us can do to have any impact whatsoever on human population. But wait a minute, number two, rule number two, there is one thing. It turns out that human population growth in Europe and North America is already slowing down uh, because of, for various reasons. Um, Asia is pretty much locked on target to slow down. Even Asia, Central America, Latin America, South America, every part of the world is pretty much locked in place to slow down and uh, have their human population drop. But what continent am I not mentioning? What is the Africa? continent? Yes, thank you. The continent that no one mentions. It's not a country, it's a continent. Um, Africa, rule number two, Africa, is the only game in town. Human population, peak human will come sooner or later, depending on Africa, and not just anything in Africa. It depends on education in Africa, and not just any education in Africa. And I said this before, do you remember what I said? Education of women in Africa? Yes, thank you so much, Logan. Um, the education of girls and women in Africa is the only thing that is going to impact uh, this curve at this point. Um, so what does that have to do with architecture? Architecture can't do anything about that, can it? Not so fast. Jackie Ajiari, uh, a thesis student, is not just doing a thesis on uh, girls and women education in Africa, she is, she and her extended family of doctors and nurses and healthcare workers are actually going to Ghana and they are, um, they are doing it. And she is going to build a school. Uh, and this curve is going to change because of the work of a Wentworth graduate. So here's, you know, the rest of the world is catching up and taking interest in this. Um, this is the more recent uh, prediction um, shown graphically and um, the, we don't have time to get into why uh, population is uh, moving very rapidly towards replacement rate all over the world, but it has to do with how expensive it is to raise a child. Next time you see your parents, uh, say thank you. The other thing, uh, as implied by this title, planetary urbanization, is somewhere around 2010, uh, the process of urbanization, people leaving the countryside, moving to cities, passed um, from majority rural global population to majority urban. Now, the more interesting aspect of that is how many people are properly housed in humane conditions. 
Um, in 2003, you see right here, this explains it for itself. We won't dwell on it. But suffice it to say, we do we care about 2050? No, we're not designing the world for the year 2050, even though you will be reaching the peaks of your careers in 2050. Even in 2050, when you do a design, design, when you design buildings and landscapes and urban systems, those designs outlast the moment of their conception and implementation. They last a long time. These infrastructures are um, what we call permanent. So when you design, you don't design for the present, you design for peak human and beyond. So when you are designing for a set of conditions, you're, I recommend, and we do this in studio and we do it in thesis, uh, we are all designing for peak human at this point. So design for the year 2100, when the human population is reaching 11 billion, the sea level rise is expected to be about six feet above max mean um, monthly sea level rise that we need to know what the conditions are at 2100 and design for that condition. So how many squatters are there gonna be in, in 2100? We're all friends here, let's use round numbers, 4 billion. Their human population will be 11 billion. And of those 11 billion, 4 billion will be squatters. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a little uncomfortable with this term squatter. Uh, we're definitely uncomfortable with the term slums. The, the profession and the world generally has settled. They think they've settled on the term informal, but not so fast. Here comes Ignacio Cardona. He's a little bit older than you, but he's coming into the world and he's saying, whoa, 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 hey, not fast, informal. Informal is the new slum. It's a pejorative, derogatory term. Please don't use the word informal. So he is leading the way to help us figure out uh, how to uh, talk about these things. Now, you notice the global overview in 2012, uh, Venezuela doesn't even show up. It's because Venezuela is at such a state of free fall. It's a failed state uh, that we don't even have the data there but um, it's up there. The, the poster child of displacement, internally displaced peoples uh, through violence, through absence of opportunity, uh, through direct threats to the health and well-being of humanity. Syria is the world champion, uh, the reigning champion of the world right now. Um, and this, uh, there are two things. There are two forces, this is the summary of decades of uh, urban studies research. It makes a difference. When people come to the city, there are generally two categories of forces. There are forces of pull and forces of push. Some of you have recently gone from suburbia to the city, some of you who are on campus now. Uh, you have all been pulled to the city. Uh, it may feel like your parents pushed you into the city to go to college, but in the larger categorization of human population flows, you would be categorized as pulled. Pulled is good. Pulled is, uh, hey, there's an opportunity in the city. Um, I'm going to give it a shot. When people are pulled into the city, they are coming to cities for opportunity. And so even in these informal settlements, we've been conditioned in the United States to believe that when people live in slums, they are the losers of the world, right? They live in the slums, they're losers, right? Almost it's built, it's embedded into the mindset of uh, the United States culture. People who live in poverty are losers, they should themselves up by their bootstraps is what uh, the politicians want us to believe. Uh, and it's their own fault. That lets the politicians off the hook. It's a little too convenient. And it's not that simple as we will be looking at this the rest of the semester. There's an urgent burning question for you right there. 
why do people live in informality? Is it that they're losers or is it something else? That's a question that we need to answer urgently in this course and in this world. Um, the other force is push. What would push someone off the countryside and into the cities? Well, here's something. Men with guns showed up in my village and they shot all the uh, men uh, between 15 and 65. That's a push, that happens. That's happening where you see the big blue dots, that's, um, those populations are growing in part uh, because of that. Um, and uh, so these forces of push are really the problem. Pull forces will take it. That's a population of, of entrepreneurs, of go-getters, they're seeking opportunity. They are what uh, some people really sloppily call the middle class. Um, by the way, whenever you hear the term middle class, it's, it's uh, really worse than the term slum or informality. It's, um, it cloaks, it, it's more of a problem than it is a solution. There is no middle anymore, almost anywhere. There's no middle class. Instead, we now use the term consumer class. The consumer class are the ones who have discretionary funds that they can use to go shopping. They can use to educate their children. Uh, we are all here because our families are among the consumer class. We have discretionary income and that money is available uh, beyond satisfying basic needs. We are consumers. The people who are not members of the consumer class do not have discretionary to go shopping in the shopping mall. They go to the shopping mall, but they do it to as a recreational activity. They don't buy stuff. Um, and so dis people with discretionary income, people with opportunity, um, so the people who are pulled into cities by opportunity, they are the future consumer, consumer class. They are the future entrepreneurs. They are the drivers of the economy. They are an extremely positive force in the cities where they are pulled to. In contrast, the populations that are pushed off the land are made into refugees. They are seeking refuge. They are internally displaced people or externally displaced people. The term internal and external refers to whether they cross a national boundary. So for decades, the people of Medellin, Colombia were displaced by the drug wars out of their homes, off their lands, into the cities, into the city of Caracas. They were externally displaced, they walked. They, they fled with their possessions were then robbed of those possessions uh, by bandits, walked uh, very, very hungry, some of, many of them dying along the way across the border into Venezuela, where they became refugees and in the uh, barrios of the informal sites of Caracas. Now that flow has reversed, as Manuel referred to, the seven million Venezuelans have been displaced out of their homes. They've crossed out of Guyana City um, in Brazil, in the Southeast, and they've crossed back. A lot of them are the children of people who were displaced out of Colombia into Venezuela. Now the children are being displaced out of Venezuela back into Colombia. Hopefully they have family. And so these places are what many have theorized as states of exception. If you uh, are interested in the theoretical literature of Agamben, um, these states of exception, they are zones, they are spatial enclaves where uh, different rules apply. There's a different uh, set of systemic rules of engagement and norms of citizenship and engagement. And it is, uh, 
worth studying because the architecture of these states of exception are um, driven by and conditioned by uh, these these forces. Um, and so uh, that's the story of planetary urbanization. Um, the term planetary urbanization is a field of uh, research. It is highly theoretical research uh, driven by some of the faculty over at Harvard and elsewhere. It's in, but it is profoundly flawed because it is so disconnected. Unlike the reading, it is all theory all the time, extremely disconnected from conditions on the ground. So uh, if you're inclined, that might be an interesting direction to uh, direct your attention and reading, uh, but beware. Critical readers should look for the elements of, those, of that literature that ground their theories in actual experience. I strongly recommend the work of um, uh, Abdul Malik Simon, S-I-M-O-N-E, Abdul Malik Simon. Okay, what moves people to settle informally in and around the world? Um, these are camps. Uh, these are, uh, you know, the history of camps. This is, uh, you know, throughout history, starting with the Roman camp, it's a military enclave, and we will be digging deeper into that later in the semester as we move back in history. Um, then we have uh, the horrible conditions of the concentration camps uh, of Nazi Germany, designed by architects to be highly technically um, uh, high performance uh, machines for uh, warehousing bodies uh, while they are waiting to be processed. And the processing uh, we refer to here very darkly, and here's something to be pissed off about if you're not pissed off yet. Uh, it is a machine for killing as efficiently and uh, as massively as possible um, in the least amount of time with the least number of resources. How do we kill people? It's an architecture of death. Uh, the camps that have developed uh, over the decades uh, through armed conflict, uh, people, refugees driven off their lands and into uh, across boundaries. Uh, and if you um, look at some of these images carefully, and of course, this is too high up to use as an analysis. We need you to zoom down, bring the drone direct your drone down uh, to about 200 meters and direct it at an oblique angle to place uh, architect scale, human experience in the foreground in the context of a larger urban pattern in the background. So this is too high, but this is something that if you look carefully, you start to see uh, enclaves that are different. One of these things is not like the other, one of these things just doesn't belong. Can you say which thing is not like the other before I'm done singing my song? Sesame Street. Beirut. Uh, I had a, a co-instructor before Manuel, uh, Ali Khodor, who uh, graduated from MIT, uh, doing research on Beirut, Lebanon. One of the most uh, impacted cities in the world when it comes to refugee populations. And um, he, in his work, identified different enclaves in the city of Lebanon that were settled at different moments because of uh, military conflicts. And so his analysis, again, too high up to meet our standards, and he's uh, making the mistake of, uh, in terms of our perspective. We don't use, friends don't let friends use opaque uh, lines uh, because that obscures, because of the use of the opaque line, we can't really examine, we can't zoom in and examine the architectural vision on the ground. So friends don't let friends use opaque lines. Um, but these, the, the city of Beirut 
is a mosaic of uh, residential neighborhoods that were developed through the economic forces of the formal economy and uh, interspersed with enclaves that are very, very distinct when uh, populations were forced into a specific location to self-build. First, they were given tents and gradually, as it looked like things were not gonna change, they uh, self-built homes uh, over time and it became the fabric of the city. And this is a crucial understanding uh, of refugee camps. To the present moment, refugee camps are established all over the world with the delusion assumption that populations will come in and populations will go out. Historically, we know that that is a lie. Historically, we know that uh, 19 times out of 20, a body that moves into this neighborhood never leaves. Uh, refugee camps, uh, which leads to treatment being explored by one of the thesis students this semester, refugee camps are future urban formations. That's lay out the refugee camp such that it produces good urban form, good architecture. That is his thesis. Uh, a very interesting contribution uh, that no one has really explored sufficiently before. Thank you very much, Trevor Salvini. So um, financialization of property. Did we talk about it? We mentioned it in that final lecture of History Theory 2. Remember the fireworks in the Burj Khalifa? Well, we're going to do it quickly here because um, this is another force. So one force driving, pushing people into cities is um, bullets and death. Violence drives people off their lands and drives them to refugee camps in cities or the future fragments of cities. Another thing that drives people out of their homes, uh, breaks up communities and leads to large scale death and displacement uh, is um, affordability. Getting closer to home. This is something that um, uh, if any of you are in studio this semester, this is, this has, a, here we are, this is why. Why is the Wentworth Institute of Technology uh, pushing us to be in class, in studio, on campus? Here's why. Dubai. So Dubai is famously uh, a desert with no resources, no water, no nothing to uh, you know to commend itself as a place to be, other than it has been successful as a port for the transshipment of oil, and consciously because of the oil embargo. Uh, in on various places in the Middle East, uh, it has a place of illegal transshipment of goods uh, coming in and out of Iran um, to the rest of the world um, because of the embargo uh, on Iran. Um, and so great wealth is passing through this port. Um, one thing they have an abundance of is land. They have a virtually infinite amount of land. So therefore, why are they building skyscrapers? The buildings in this slide, as I said at the end of the History Theory 2 course, uh, are as tall or taller than those three tall buildings in Boston, Prudential Tower, Hancock Tower, and, what's, and Dalton Place, uh, new residential tower. Why skippers in Dubai? Do, is the land so expensive that they have to build up in order to justify the purchase of the land? No. As I said, there is no land scarcity. They have a virtually limitless amount of land. 
here, the reason they build up is because uh, in the instrument world, yes, if you have $10 million, raise your hand if you have $10 million to invest. Please, uh, my advice to you is to don't put everything in the stock market because um, when things go south, uh, you can lose it all. So as, as, as a financial advisor, I'm telling you, diversify. And one of the key investments uh, for diversification is real estate. The benefit of real estate is it's real, real, real. And so its value is subject to different forces than the stock market. When, and so historically, real estate can go up when the stock market goes down. Stock market can go up even when real estate goes down. So it's a perfect diversification. Call up your broker right now. Uh, no, wait till the end of class and have them diversify your portfolio. Now, in order to invest in real estate, you need something to invest in. Uh, and there are new things called sovereign wealth funds, which countries are using to help control their currency fluctuations. And so the sovereign wealth fund of the United Arab Emirates uh, required a, a means of diversification that they could control on their soil in a single piece of real estate. So each of these towers is a real estate investment. Uh, and it's built in order to park value in a piece of real estate. What is the occupation rate of the apartments and offices in these towers? No one knows. It's illegal to publish the occupation rate. Instead of the occupation rate, what they are publishing is the ownership rate. How many units have been purchased? How many square meters have been leased? That is, is information that they publish. So, and they publish very rosy um, statistics. It's 99% leased, it's 99% owned. And we presume that that means it's needed and people are living in it. No, these towers are empty. No one needs to live there. There's no reason to live there. Um, and then what's this? If these are as tall as the skyscrapers in Boston and no one lives in them, or they're very, very empty, they might be half full, they might be one third full, um, why do you need this? Well, the Sovereign Wealth Fund of uh, the United Arab Emirates needs a single piece of real estate to park its funds where they can control it in a single piece of real estate. The, I took Wentworth students here and uh, we studied the building somewhat, um, there's a, a segment on the top of the building, the top, um, the top 900 meters of the building is unoccupied and unoccupiable. There's no usable uh, square meters of space because the floor plates get too small to sell as luxury apartments or even hotel rooms. So it's just empty. The purpose of that top 900 meters, and by the way, I think 900 meters is about, is it 900? I might be getting it wrong. It's about, it's whatever the distance is, it's the height of the Hancock Tower in Boston. So there is a Hancock Tower worth of building up there, the sole purpose of which is to hold up the, of the building so that the building can be celebrated as the tallest building in the world. And it turns out that, and this is the economics lesson that architect, every architect needs to have as you enter into the world. And every tenant of an urban setting needs to understand to know why it costs so damn much to rent an apartment in Boston. Why is my dorm room so expensive? Why does Wentworth need me to be on campus in order to uh, not fire its, uh, vice, its highly valued vice presidents. The reason is because real estate in cities is very expensive and the cost and value of real estate is, and this gets to the property portion of the reading, it's, it's built out of two components. The first component is something we presume as architects and as humans, we presume that there is use value. 
it is useful to be sitting in a room with an internet connection and a computer. It's right. It's useful to have a place to sleep. It's cold outside. Uh, it's useful to have warmth around you inside. That's the use value. And that's what we have seen throughout our architectural educations, because we presume that that's all there is. There's use value. Oh yeah, and beauty and aesthetic value. But all of that in real estate terms, this is a real estate term, all of that value of beauty, delight that we are looking for in the architecture studio, all of that is bundled into this term use value, right? So what's the other component? Exchange value. Um, when I was growing up, and I suspect uh, some of you have a similar experience, I grew up in suburban Connecticut. Um, Manuel's lived there also um, when he was, I don't know, 16, you were in the same town. So suburban Connecticut, it was part of the uh, Connecticut apartheid system uh, outside New York City. Um, extremely segre extreme segregation enforced informally by the police force and the real estate agents of the town. And um, we lived in this very strange house. We had a family room and kitchen where the five kids in my family, that's where we always were. We were, we were always there. And then a really strange thing, there was a door beyond the kitchen. It's like, ooh, ooh, what's behind that door? Well, there was a dining room behind that door that we used twice a year, Thanksgiving, Christmas. And then there was another room beyond that dining room. It was called the living room. And there was zero living in the living room. It had a piano and that's where uh, during piano lesson years, uh, my sisters practiced the piano. And then at Christmas time, that's where we set up the Christmas tree. But the purpose of of that half of the ground floor of our house that I had growing up was exchange value. My, when my parents moved into this suburban, all white suburban town in Connecticut, uh, they purchased the house they purchased in order to invest in the real estate value of the house. And so this was all exchange value portion of the architecture. Real estate agents said, oh, when my mom would say something, she was very practical, grew up during the depression uh, on a farm in Minnesota. She would say, well, why do we, we don't need the dining room, living room and the, and the foyer, the front hall with the grand case. And the real estate agent would correct her. Oh no, oh, that's the most important part of the house. When you buy a house, you want to maintain its exchange value. It will grow in value. And what, if you ever sell the house, that will be your retirement. And so uh, all real estate has these two components to it, use value, exchange value. Now, uh, the Burj Khalifa and the other towers of Dubai in the setting of an endless desert of infinite land. Uh, this is an, ex an example of exchange value gone crazy. There is there is very, very little use value. It is driven, this architecture is driven by exchange value. And um, I want us all to pay attention to Dalton Place here in Boston. <clears throat> in the coming weeks and months, people will be moving into Dalton Place. And uh, especially during the winter months, it is interesting to look up at the tower and just notice which floors have lights on, which floors don't have lights on. It turns out that throughout the major cities of the world, London, Paris, Tokyo, New York, Boston, uh, that there are towers, especially condominium towers, where the expensive penthouse and expensive condos are purchased by shell companies, shell corporations. There is no way to know the actual identity of the owner. Uh, and often through investigative, investigative uh, journalism, and you see this uh, article in 2017 in the New York Times, uh, they have discovered that the uh, owners that are purchasing these apartments 
through shell corporations are sometimes money launderers, terrorist organizations, uh, like the Revolutionary Guard of Iran, uh, the oligarchs of Russia who are trying to conceal money, uh, anyone who has a huge chunk of money and they wanna hide it somewhere. Or people like you and me who have $10 million portfolios and we just wanna diversify our investments uh, into real estate. We'll buy a unit in Boston or New York and we will maybe visit it once a, once a year, but maybe not. Uh, just down the street, Cambridge, there's a huge mansion um, it must have cost them $3 million to, to buy. And I watched them over the years pick up the whole house, move it to one part of the site, build a four-story basement structure under it, move it back, change their minds, move it again, and then build on a huge wing. Uh, it must have been $10 million worth of construction. I'm pretty sure no one has ever lived in this building. It is simply a real estate investment. And so by checking the utility bills of units in London and other architectural researchers have been able to identify which units are actually occupied and which units are not. And try, starting to uh, figure out the impact of uh, these exchange value uh, uh, purchases of real estate on the cost of housing in the cities where they occur. Why is your rent in Boston so high? Is it so much cheaper for you to go to college remotely and hang out in your parents' house? Uh, it, or it has to do with exactly this, the exchange value of real estate. And um, architects are employed to increase the spectacle of real estate to increase the story um, of architecture, to increase the appearance of celebrity and stardom of actual buildings. And this grows on uh, what we looked at in History Theory 2, uh, learning from Las Vegas, uh, Robert Venturi, Denise Scott Brown, uh, the celebration of architecture, the, the use of art elements to create spectacle. And notice the hand gesture. I don't know if you can see my spectacle. Okay, so here comes the spectacle. So in order to support the storyline that the real estate that you buy today is going to be as or more valuable 10 years from now, we create spectacle. We create spectacle by hiring celebrity architects, star architects to design our buildings, Look at the residential towers, the pencil thin residential towers of New York City in Manhattan. Uh, this is part of the role of architecture to create spectacle to justify the storyline, the narrative that these purchases, these investments in real estate are going to continue to hold their value in the future regardless of the occupancy rates. Yes, the Burj Khalifa is empty, 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 but man, is it owned, owned, owned. The reason it is owned so high is because it's considered to be a good real estate investment. You don't have to ever go, you don't ever have to visit. Uh, you just have to own it. It's going to hold its value. Just take a look at the uh, yearly fireworks celebration. If you're concerned about the Burj Khalifa holding its value, here's uh, a ritual performance renewed every year to demonstrate why you should be confident that your real estate holding is going to be stable. This is increasingly a very important purpose that uh, architecture performs in the service financialization of the world, of securing the financial integrity of the, the ghost economy. There's a real economy of about $300 trillion of actual goods and services being exchanged down here on the surface of the planet. On top of that economy, 
there is a second economy of speculative investment. And that's worth about 10 times as much as the real economy. On top of that, there's another, there's a third level up in the heavens that is the derivative economy of the investment economy. Architecture uh, traditionally has always performed the purpose of supporting use value, goods and services exchanged here on the planet's surface. But increasingly, the needs of the financial sector require architects to be celebrities and to uh, create spectacular buildings uh, to support these narratives that upon which the financial integrity of that secondary and tertiary economy depend. And sorry, while the values, uh, every time the fireworks goes off, uh, further reinforcing and boosting the value of every square meter of real estate in the Burj Khalifa, every square meter around it in all of Dubai and in the United Arab, Arab Emirates, Abu Dhabi, Doha, all of these cities, the, the real estate valuation increases proportional to the value of the Burj Khalifa. Similarly, if we keep watching Dalton, the, Dal the two Dalton Place Tower in Boston, every time the value of a square foot of real estate in that tower goes up, the value of all real estate in Boston, in the Boston region, goes up with it. It's a, it's a curve that looks something like the tower itself, uh, Burj Khalifa, it tapers, and there's a, there's a curve according to the spatial arrangement of real estate in the Boston region. And when the peak goes up at Dalton Tower, uh, all of the curve goes up. So the real estate of the surrounding neighborhoods, the value goes up. The value of your parents' house in the suburbs of Boston goes up. The value of my unit here in Cambridge goes up. Thank you very much as a property owner. The value of the dormitories, the amount of money that Wentworth charges or the dormitory room goes up to the point where the value of the real estate on the Wentworth campus becomes an important source of operating income and in support that, that subsidizes my salary and uh, all of those vice presidents and the purchase of new buildings, et cetera. Uh, and so thank you very much for moving into the dorm and paying those uh, costs because it really is important. Yes, I hear in the news, there's some scientific evidence that there's a threat from the pandemic, but the concrete scientific evidence that uh, the more students who come on campus and uh, pay the price of the dormitory is is conclusive, it's very clear that the more people come onto campus and attend class, the greater the viability of the future of Wentworth is. Okay, moving on. Very quickly, what does informality have to do with the United States? Um, we've looked at people being pulled and pushed into cities and the planetary urbanization. We've looked at the, the negative impact of push forces of refugee camps and financial refugees. As gentrification, as gentrification occurs, people are pushed out of cities and they become financial refugees uh, and their suffering is measured in the length of their commute times. So people are being pushed further and further out of cities to places they can uh, afford so, uh, and live in the quality of state that they want to enjoy. So they, they, they keep moving out until they can afford the kind of house they want. And then whatever the commuting time is, is what the commuting time is, whatever the carbon footprint of all that automobile dependence is, it is. So notice that's connected back to uh, the Anthropocene and we will spend an entire week pretty soon automobile dependency and its relationship to architecture and urban form. So here we are 
in the United States, what do we do when people cannot afford housing? Well, we said that we, um, we think of people who live in public housing and, uh, and uh, inadequate housing as losers. Why is that? These developments are run by the St. Louis Housing Authority. This is a far cry from the crowded, collapsing tenements that many of these people have known. Here in bright new buildings with spacious grounds, they can live. It was a very beautiful place, like a big a hotel resort, I'd say. It was like uh, an oasis in the desert. All this newness. I never thought I'd live in that kind of a surrounding. What happened? Well, one day we woke up and it was all gone. <laughs> pulled up with the moving van. I knew at that point that hell on earth. Crew and I roll looks like a battleground. Vandalism and neglect have left fear among the remaining occupants. In the middle of the St. Louis Park, it had solved its low-cost problem, but instead, a monster was created. The experiment had gone terribly awry. It was just uncontrollable. So the story of so the story of modern architecture in the United States is integrally in mind with the use of modern form public housing in the United States. In the rest of the world, we don't call it public housing; we call it social housing. So if you use the term public housing. I'm probably referring to the United States. Um, if I'm using the term social housing, I'm probably referring to the rest of the world. It's kind of like the metric system. Um, so um, this is a reference point that is crucial to your future careers. Why is it that your residential clients are not interested in that amazing, gorgeous, modern, uh, style of architecture that we're training you to produce. It's because of the real estate value, the exchange value of modern uh, architecture is lower because of the, the tastes and the culture of US um, home buyers. And that's not everyone, it's home buyers. It's, it's the consumer class that buys homes. Um, as in, deeply impacted by the association of modern architecture with losers. And I'm, uh, I'm deliberately using this pejorative term because that's kind of the point. So um, this is very much uh, a, an issue. And Newworthy, uh, Newworth did a fantastic job of pointing out that the demand for housing has never and uh, will never be satisfied through governments building housing. That ship has sailed. There is no scenario in which a government uh, can supply housing to meet the demand of housing uh, for housing needs, with two notable exceptions. This is kind of like the uh, population thing. I say something that is so black and white. And then I say the, the exception um, where that first thing that I stated so firmly is not true. The exception to this rule is Singapore and Hong Kong. Singapore and Hong Kong through extreme effort and investment provided public ho social housing to its populations and to make sure everyone is housed. So Singapore uh, had 85% of the population living in social housing. Hong Kong, uh, similarly, and even more, I think. Um, and so that's, that's important background. Everywhere else in the world where we built social housing for the very poor outside of the United States, like in, um, in African and Asian contexts, we built um, social housing and we subsidized uh, the costs of that housing and made it available 
to uh, the consumer class. So the consumer class, government officials, uh, people who had discretionary income, were the ones who took advantage of this subsidized social housing, while the poorest of the, and not even the poorest of the poor, but anyone outside of the consumer class, it was too expensive even to live in the social housing for various reasons. And so now it's us to the heart of the matter. Um, we're gonna move through some things very quickly here. What defines an informal settlement? United Nations has a group called UN Habitat and Wentworth graduates who come through this course have gone to work with UN Habitat they are located in Nairobi, uh, Kenya, Africa, and uh, that it is their job to figure this stuff out. And in 2002, I think, they established the five conditions uh, to, that define informality. And to be designated an informal settlement, uh, a place needs to spy three out of these five conditions. Condition one, um, well, they have to fail at three out of these five. These are stated as positive, uh, positive conditions. And if uh, a place fails to meet three or more of these five, it is defined according to UN habitat standards as uh, informal, inadequate. We'll see what Ignacio has to say about this. So number one, in order to be saved from the plight of informality, you have secure land rights. And as we know from the reading, there are multiple ways to have secure land rights. One of them is ownership, a title deed, fee simple ownership is what we call it here in the United States. Um, but uh, as Newarth points out, there are multiple ways to achieve secure land rights. Um, Residents need to believe that there is not a significant risk of displacement in, as a precondition for them to invest in the improvement of the housing conditions. So that's number one. Number two, they need access to adequate, safe drinking water. Um, and what does that mean? It, it is defined as 20 liters of safe water per person per day, and access means can carry those 20 liters. How much does 20 liters weigh? Someone put that in the chat. Um, you need to be able to carry that 20 liters from a half hour away or less. Does that mean I can uh, bring my walk my jug home and then chug out of it? No. Most of at least half the population of the world. They don't drink the water that comes out of the tap. We boil it first. And I'm speaking for that half of humanity. I'm taking on that voice, even though uh, I'm not qualified to take on that voice. I still, I do the best I can to place myself empathetically into the shoes of those um, who face this issue. We, carry the water home, 44 pounds, thank you, Logan. Um, and then before we drink it, before we cook with it, we boil it. We boil it for at least 10 minutes. That's the UN standard. Um, and then, then it's safe. We've just killed all the organic uh, materials that might be present in the water and we're ready to cook and clean with it. That's why when you travel to um, Latin America, uh, when, you, when you visit these places that don't have clean drinking water, can you drink the water? They tell you, don't drink the water, don't, you know, don't drink the water. You can drink the water because, please, we are also humans down here. We, we can't drink infected water any more than you can drink infected water. <laughs> it would be crazy. Friends don't let friends not boil the water before we use it. Okay, number three, adequate access to sanitation and other crucial infrastructures 
like electricity and bizarrely increasing internet. Uh, I was surprised to see that. Um, but um, yes, the argument raging in urban studies right now is about, is the internet a crucial infrastructure for proper residential? And the evidence suggests yes. So I don't know if they've added it to this list, but I wouldn't be surprised. So uh, a very small percentage of the human population um, has a pipe that takes their sewage into proper facilities, tiny percentage. Increasingly, it's clear that that's not even a good idea. If you have a lot of shit, uh, don't concentrate it, keep it distributed and process it through composting methods uh, as a strategy for slowing climate change by replenishing the soil. Yes, there are safe, uh, reasonable means to take human waste, process it, and it is gold when it comes to uh, revitalizing soils, which turns out appears increasingly to be our best hope for reversing the accumulation of carbon in the atmosphere is restoring the health of soils. And by the way, as an added advantage, uh, revitalized soils with healthy organic material is also as a fringe benefit it's also our greatest strategy for solving the water crisis. I don't know if you've heard, but for lifetimes, water, water has recently been financialized. The financial sector has recently earned the right from the Securities Exchange Commission of the United States to invest in water futures. Sorry. Um, the world is about to face a run on water as a financial strategy. So when the price of drinking water suddenly spikes and it becomes a hardship for you or takes a bite out of your budget, it's because Wall Street is interested in your drinking water uh, because it's a way to boost their uh, and diversify their portfolios. Sorry about that. Something to work on as you move forward. So fourth out of five, adequate residential space, five square meters per person or more. That doesn't mean in your bedroom. That means if you have a household of three people, it needs to be 15, the house needs to be 15 square meters or more. That includes the bathroom, the kitchen, the hallway, uh, the front foyer, the living room, all of that. Uh, if you were sitting in the classroom, I would ask you, how big is five square meters? Um, someone, low, how big is five square meters in American, in North American, in the United States? Um, it's pretty big, right? Five square meters per person. Um, and number five. Back when they first put this rules out in 2002, it wasn't self-built housing. Thank you, uh, Joseph. Um, 50, 50 square feet or so. We're all friends here. Here's a trick moving forward. Um, those of you who are good at math, when you see five square meters and need to know how, that, how big that is in square feet, add a zero. But don't do that unless you're good at math. It's okay. Now, if you see 50 square feet and someone says, how much is that in square meters? What do you do? You take away the zero, but only if you're good at math. Uh, Self-built housing is the standard now. Uh, that used to be uh, inadequate housing, structurally inadequate housing. Um, one of the slides I'm gonna add for next year is I'm gonna show you how these houses are built. It turns out these houses generally are built as steel reinforced concrete frame buildings with brick infill. They are actually, they have greater structural integrity than the house, your, than your parents' house. Sorry, no offense to your parents. Uh, platform frame construction is wonderful, but it's limited to about three stories. 
Look what these people are doing. They're building a, a steel reinforced concrete frame house. Then uh, as we read in the reading, I'm selling off my roof rights uh, that gives uh, renews the right to the piece of land. My new upstairs neighbor sells off his roof rights and off we go into the sky, five, six stories, no problem. Steel reinforced concrete frame structures. Uh, we now are, have been compelled by the humbling uh, demonstration of structural integrity. We've uh, been uh, compelled to shift the definition to self-built housing. The one exception here, this is Caracas, I believe, um, is that the steep slopes are extremely unstable. That is the most perilous threat to these neighborhoods, is the slopes will give way because the foundations are inadequate. Welcome to architecture. Now, Ignacio, uh, his research has done a very convincing job of pointing out that Sure, economists may uh, be able to justify identifying the formal economy as distinct from the informal economy, yes. But for architects and urbanists to take that terminology from uh, economics and apply it to architecture, no, 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 not so fast. Um, here's uh, Caracas again. Um, Here's the architecture school um, under current conditions. Um, well, this is even before the pandemic. They didn't have electricity. The students were showing up at studio. The first thing they do is they have chores. There's a chore wheel. They clean the bathrooms. They sweep the floors. Um, and uh, because there's the school has shut down, they show up and they've reoccupied the campus uh, in order to pursue their education under extreme hardship. Think about that. Um, so um, I'm gonna jump ahead. Ignacio did this brilliant analysis of the typical uh, house in Petare Norte um, uh, it, it, uh, last decade. And this is the basis for a lot of his research that he's finishing his doctoral. I think, did he defend? I think he defended. Um, and his analysis indicates that 27% of the resources that are used to produce the architecture of these neighborhoods is formal as compared to 37% informal. Um, and so um, not so fast. So he's adding levels of nuance to this analysis. He's also bringing his own designing for life uh, approaches of engaging the community and producing out of this uh, parking lot uh, for a bus company uh, adjacent to Petare Norte informal community. Uh, he's working with the community to plan and design and implement um, a, a, a recreational center um, accessible to the neighborhood as the first step of creating uh, an, a larger urban gesture that brings the people down the hill into the city, very similar to what we see in designing for life strategies in Medellin and other places. Okay, I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm gonna move quickly through this quick survey of neighborhoods that you've read about now, and that let's get some, let's associate some visual uh, with this. And so here's Kibera in Nairobi, Kenya, a, a short walk away from the UN Habitat headquarters. Even where the UN Habitat headquarters is giving great attention, uh, the struggle continues. Nairobi uh, is a hugely successful, wonderful city with the largest informal settlement uh, in the, on the continent of Africa. Um, Southlands Estate, this is where uh, the reading opens up, um, talking about the conditions here. Um, this is what it looks like. And in the midst of the informal settlement, there are these formal developments, uh, social housing, 
Uh, the key architecture here you might think is the building, but think again, what is the impact of the architecture of this wall and this separation between the two zones? It turns out that the walls themselves are to a large extent the most impactful and uh, significant aspect of the architecture of these arrangements. Here's some more views of the two sides of that wall. Again, these views are not good. They're not, um, we please don't use ground level views for your analysis. Ground level views do not uh, give us access. It gives, yes, it gives us access to architectural scale human experience, check. It doesn't give us, it excludes us from accessing the larger pattern of urban forces and forms. We need both in the foreground of your aerial perspective. We need to have direct access to people and their activities and what they're doing. Um, but we also need the larger urban system. This is um, work very similar to what uh, Felipe Del Monte, a friend of the course and the programs, a friend of Manuel's and mine, has done in Latin America of taking what would otherwise be an informal mobility strategy and basically systematizing it using smartphones such that uh, it is accessible as if it were a formal system. These are privately owned, cooperatively managed networks of of young men, mostly, uh, with Jeeps that they borrow or lease, and they drive up and down these set routes, and all you have to do is scratch your head, and they will lurch to the side of the road to pick you up because they want the seven cents um, that they get, and they get like a half of a cent of those seven cents. The owner of the vehicle gets the six and a half cents. Um, for picking you up. And so they, there's ways using smartphones, MIT uh, architects have done this as well, um, as well as Felipe, um, but setting up, formalizing, systematizing the systems so that they operate with the efficiency and benefit to the community as if it were formally um, offered. I think I, part of the reading was um, the extreme wealth uh, inequality in Dharavi. Um, here's the tower of the one of the wealthiest man in India. This is his house with a helicopter pad on the roof. Um, that's what it looks like. Looks like uh, a knockoff of a Diller Scofidio um, Herzog de Muran approach to architecture. Here's uh, a, a water pipe supplying Dara, uh, the city of Mumbai and uh, what it looks like where it crosses through Dharavi. And the solutions that have been proposed in Dharavi involve um, giving formal housing, social housing, formal social housing to residents who have a letter of ownership as of the year 2000, it's been extended to 2006. And if you have that letter, we will build you a tower and we'll let you live in that tower, but hold on, wait a minute, you are depriving me of my source of income by removing me from the ground plane. Because here on the ground plane in Dharavi, we can sell things. We have access to people going by. We can process recycling. We can build clay. There's a huge clay pottery industry that's worth over a million dollars a year of exchange, um, probably closer to $2 million now. Um, there are dye works, fabric. In all of these settlements that we're talking about, industry is occurring. People are making money. They are living right adjacent to where they are working and selling, probably all three, while taking care and educating their children. So that is five or six different distinct uses. Um, that are occurring in these single places. And when you offer me a place in this formal social housing, government officials of Mumbai 
I have to say, thanks, but no thanks. I need to continue making money. If I live on the third floor of this social housing, you are depriving me of access to um, my, my livelihood. Um, this is at the core of several Wentworth thesis projects. Right now, Salama Witbalcha is developing a plan for uh, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, that deals exactly with this issue of how do you improve people's housing without depriving them of access to their livelihood and access to their community. This is the proposal for Dairavi. Um, not surprising, an American trained architect uh, from Mumbai has uh, come back to do be a do-gooder in his community. And oh my God, uh, his intentions are good. His outcome is disastrous. Istanbul, Turkey, uh, the new canal um, plan to displace the community, uh, the communities. Um, uh, we don't have time. Cairo, sorry. We don't have time. The trash heaps, the park, etc. I'm quickly moving through um, the recycling to get to, um, yes, our favorite case study of Caracas. Some of the designing for life uh, uh, strategies, what they look like. The, the vertical gem by Urban Think Tank, some of the other work, uh, Carlota. Cheryl Bratzos, uh, a student from the 2009 Caracas Studio, uh, developed this library water uh, collection uh, proposal for the site near uh, Villa Julio Blanco. Look how powerful it is to take a photograph, design with trace over it, and then photo collage it on top of the image. A really remarkable um, body of work that results, yes, in our favorite image ever of a student uh, moving through Wentworth. There it is again. Okay, no time for this. Uh, two years ago, we didn't show you this, but last year, uh, Manuel and I did uh, Urbanism Studio fall senior year. Uh, this is heads up two years ago, two falls ago uh, in 2019, we worked in the community of La Cherneca in Caracas, Venezuela. It has a cable car uh, to it. Ignacio has published something very critical of the cable car usage. And here we are um, proposing interventions in La Cherneca that builds on the existence of a school and produces this tower building that permits, uh, um, permits people to walk up uh, or get access up and down the slope uh, through the introduction of this housing. Uh, this was a group project integrating the school, a church, community center, um, an elevated street in the sky, and modular housing lifted and put into place by the crane that connects the people down here and up on the slopes uh, to the Metro Cable station at the top to try to remedy the weakness of the Metro Cable um, implementation. Finally, the final topic. Um, when I said it's hard for me to, um, to speak as a resident of informal settlements, um, I exaggerated um, because um, when I graduated from architecture school, there was a recession and instead of um, getting, you know, when I, every, I am pay, I worked at I am pay associates elsewhere. And when people were getting laid off, I had this fantastic opportunity. I got a three month grant to do, go do research in the country of Indonesia on the island of Java. And I needed a place to live. Um, the place I found was in an informal settlement. It was a wealthy person's house with a boarding house for students in the center of an informal settlement. So I'd never heard of informal, informality. I had lived in slums uh, in New York City as a student, um, but I, it was, I just stumbled upon it. 
So I was there for my three month grant, uh, which I, because things are so cheap, my rent was $13 a month. The food was all you can eat for 83 cents. Uh, the best food I've ever had. I stayed for four years, wouldn't you? I mean, really. Um, so I lived in an informal settlement myself for four years. Um, and it is not in Java, it's a this is I'm ending on a positive note. Miserable, yes. Like the other informal settlements. Don't, you know, be careful with the water. You got to boil it. Um, it stinks. The sewage system is not nearly adequate. Uh, people are self-building their houses. But there are some advantages. And a, an Indonesian student at the University of Amsterdam did this really wonderful analysis. Inappropriate for our purposes because, again, it's from right above, right? We don't, friends don't let friends analyze sites from directly above from satellite. And it's opaque, it's an opaque diagram on top of the data. Um, she is making the mistake of obscuring the underlying reality. So we have to just take her word for it. We can't verify and correct her assertions. So, um, and she uses storytelling um, in a really wonderful way to get at the narrative aspects of what is it like to live in these neighborhoods. And everything she finds resonates with the four years I lived in a very similar neighborhood. Um, that people are living in these informal settlements. I'm gonna start using the term kampong. It's both plural and singular. So the kampong is a term for informal settlements used in Southeast Asia, in the Malay speaking <clears throat> areas of Southeast Asia. So it has different names in every country as the reading points out, um, but similar characteristics. When I live here in the kampong, I live here with my family, I work here, I produce an income, I take care of my children, and I socialize with my neighbors. And when I have to run to get supplies um, to support my sewing business or my laundry business or my food production business or my selling of you know, tea packets, and there are multiple different businesses um, that occur along these alleyways that are called gang. Um, uh, and so along these alleyways, there are multiple businesses and uh, the, the office workers at lunchtime come down the towers, walk across the canal, the drainage canal, and enter the kampong because you can have, like I said, these fantastic meals for 83 cents. Um, and the life of this place is so vibrant and so wonderful and uh, the streets are not clogged with automobiles. These streets are the living rooms of everybody. So um, the front of every house is a, is a place for selling. Behind that, there might be a room where there's a TV. And behind that, there might be, and part of that is a kitchen. Um, uh, but people sleep everywhere. When it's time to sleep, Every room in the house has people sleeping in. Um, sometimes they build, when they are able to accumulate enough wealth, they build a second story. Um, but in the front of the house, there is selling and producing going on. Um, I bought my wife a pair of glasses last fall or two falls ago um, from one of the shops here. Um, we've been looking for years and months for the right pair of glasses. Um, and um, I found it in the Kampong of Jakarta uh, about 14 months ago. I should have bought two. It cost all of $11 for these um, very high-end frames. I should have bought three. Anyway, these are multi-use mixed income because people get rich uh, and they don't leave. 
like the doctor's house where I was able to rent a room for $13 a month. This family was extremely wealthy, but they lived in the kampong. And so it's a mixed community and they don't have uh, unemployment insurance. They don't have health insurance. When uh, my neighbor's husband broke his arm and couldn't work for three months, um, his wife went door to door and I entertained her with tea on my front porch. And after uh, three, uh, you know, after you know, 15 minutes of conversation, she got quiet and all shy. And that was my signal to say, oh, you seem disturbed. Um, what's wrong? To show my concern. And then only after cajoling her does she share with me that her husband had broke his arm, has been out of work, and uh, her family cannot afford the school fees to keep their daughter in school. And so I gave her, you know, I was uh, trying to stretch my three month grant. I think I gave her the equivalent of like $15. And oh my God, it changed her entire uh, prospects and that of her family, but she stayed calm and she smiled and said, thank you. I was not inundated by people asking for money after that. I was overwhelmed with a sense of joy, knowing that you could actually have an impact, impact on people's lives with so little money. It made me love living in the compound even more. And some of my best friends you know, were very well dressed, had a motorbike. I'm sure they have a cell phone now and very successful but they lived in a plywood box. Uh, my friend Bambang Irwan showed me his house. It was a two, it was not even a room, two compartment plywood box. The only door was a piece of cloth hanging at the front. Um, I'm, he was one of the smartest people. Uh, he was going places. I'm sure he's uh, the president of something now, um, but that's my firsthand experience that these places can actually be wonderful. And it's part of the insight that we bring to the designing for life uh, activities of architecture, that the solution, the last thing you wanna do is to bulldoze anything and to create a single use residential quarter based on a United States um, bizarre image of what the world should be with all of its property ownership financialization, exchange value. Friends don't let friends impose these destructive visions on the rest of the world. That's the lecture. Thank you very much. Good luck with your work between now and Wednesday. If you have questions, use the WhatsApp channel. Uh, if you wanna hang out after class, I'm here. Thank you very much. See you on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>